Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Max Stirner. In the second of two lectures, we will finish our analysis of his book, The Ego and Its Own. This is a response to a patron's request within the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Link to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. Now, Stirner opens part second, as it is called in my translation, by noting the irony that the um, same modern secular rationalists who pride themselves on having successfully dissolved the mystical beyond where God used to live continue to adhere just as stubbornly to the inner beyond where an abstraction called man or mankind or human nature also supposedly lives. Now, Stirner implies that the unspoken motive lying behind their projection of mankind is a desire to seize a freedom which is itself ironically ruled out by this same projection of an inner beyond. For Stirner actually sounds uncannily similar to the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski when he asks, does not the spirit thirst for freedom? Alas, not my spirit alone, but my body thirsts for it hourly. In other words, freedom is a hard-wired need going down, according to Ted Kaczynski, to the level of your biology. And for that reason, you have an interest in trying to seek out those conditions where that freedom might be most attainable. The irony, though, is that most of the people who desire freedom, both for Kaczynski and Stirner, actually work against their interests by trying to promote the same conditions which are antithetical to it. For Kaczynski, this is, of course, um, the condition of modern technology. For him, that is incompatible with real freedom because the two have an inverse relation to one another. The more you have of one, in other words, the less you can have of the other. Well, Stirner also notes that real freedom is in incompatible with something. But for him, it's not just technology, but rather this underlying problem of projecting the inner beyond where the abstract idea called mankind exists. For Stirner, that's what's really incompatible with freedom. Because mankind, as we saw in the last lecture, is ultimately just the name for another ghost which only seems to exist so long as people believe that it does. Well, just as Kaczynski was extremely specific about the reasons why modern technology and freedom are incompatible with one another through um, demonstrating that real freedom is not just an abstract idea. Instead, freedom for Kaczynski is a supremely concrete thing. That is the word for an iteration through the power process in which one can posit a goal, expend some effort towards it, and then achieve that goal, preferably with a certain amount of autonomy over how one will get to do so. Well, we can see under those terms that one can only really be free to go through the power process if one does not have any interference from the same global technological system, which is hardwired by its very nature to seize control of all of the really serious matters in life, such as the production and distribution of food or drinkable water, while leaving you with nothing except very trivial surrogate activities like, say, collecting stamps or cheering for an NFL football team. You'll kind of feel free if you're able to obsess over whether um, the Philadelphia Eagles are going to uh, win the NFC East, for example, but you won't really be free because the conditions to go through the power process for something really serious and meaningful are negated by the same technological system which you enthusiastically support the progress of because of a misunderstanding of how these terms are related. Well, so too for Stirner, real freedom is only really real if that is an alias for the most concrete thing of all, which is property. It would make sense that one can only be concretely free through property, for the freedom to have and enjoy some desired thing can only be really actualized if I own that thing. Without property, freedom remains purely abstract because for all of its uh, being elevated onto an ideological pedestal, it will still ultimately bring you nothing. What you really desire then is not a universal freedom which could be shared by all of mankind collectively. 
but instead an ownness, which basically requires the coining of a new term to be described. You might recall from the first lecture that the book's German title, Der Einzige und Sein Eigentum, is usually translated as the ego and its own, but it has been argued that the unique one and his property might be a more exact translation, though I noted before that no really exact translation is possible. At any rate, the idea that the unique one can only really be unique, if it has property, is expressed as early as the title of the book itself, and certainly is key to understanding the second part. In the second part, Stirner clarifies that the biggest difference between mere freedom and ownness is that mere freedom remains an inaccessible idea, or as he calls it earlier, a ghost, uh, because it's something which I can't ever fully appropriate even if I am drawn to desire it and to expend a lot, of, a lot of effort in pursuing it at great length. Ownness, on the contrary, is so much my own that it is exactly what I myself am. In fact, this ownness is all that I am. Insofar as I have any essence, that essence which defines me is just that ownness, for that is what I myself am in the proto-existentialist sense that I can no longer fall back on human nature to provide a universal definition to tell me about myself. Controversial as such a claim might seem to be at first glance, Stirner justifies it through the following analogy. If something like my hand is severed from my body, I can fully accept that that hand is no longer a part of me. Any more than, to use his own example also, a dead dog would remain a dog in the proper sense of the term after it had lost its life. Then it would just be a carcass. But the deeper, non-intuitive reason why the detached hand is no longer me is because it's no longer my own. For any question of my essence is actually just a question of my ownness in disguise. For this reason, previous attempts to pursue freedom have failed so miserably, but that was only because they made the mistake of treating freedom as some exterior object lying beyond oneself, rather than focus on the ownness which one really is. This simple shift in perspective from the outer object to the own self will provide the answer to many philosophical enigmas, such as, to use Stirner's own example, um, genius, that thing which is spoken of at great length with, uh, within, say, uh, Kant's third critique. Well, if we speak of genius in the context of figures like Mozart or Cervantes or Van Gogh, what we really mean, Stirner tells us, is that each one of these people created amazing works of art but they did so as their own, or that they created these works from their own selves qua their ownness. What we really mean when we say that these works were original is that some totally new and beautiful creation, such as uh, the novel Don Quixote or Mozart's 40th Symphony, can only appear from out of nothing through the self that created it because ownness is the real creator of all new things. In fact, ownness is the creator of everything. Likewise, what the call for freedom actually means in clear terms is that I want to be freed from that which is not I. Freedom in the naive sense of the term does not accomplish this because it leads you to pursue some desired object which lies beyond yourself, admittedly, but it does nothing to teach you more about what you yourself are. Only this new term, ownness, can call you back to your own self to pursue a freedom which is concrete rather than abstract. Or we could also say that naively defined freedom leads unidirectionally from the self to some desired thing. Ownness, in contrast, has a circular orientation leading back to one's own self. With these philosophical clarifications in place, Stirner goes on to interrogate particular political and economic ideologies of his era by asking whether liberalism can help further the goal of ownness. In its essence, liberalism is indeed supposed to be about valuing others, but if you really scratch the surface, that is contingent upon having those others be a part of or an instance of the universal mankind. The problem with this approach to the other, though, is that it leaves one stuck at the emptiest level of abstraction. In this sense, liberalism remains fully fixated on a phantasm or a spirit, which allows it 
to completely overlook what really makes you yourself. For what makes you you is not your participation in the collective man, but in stark contrast, your own ego as a radically unique ownness. Or to put this in biological or naturalistic terms, liberalism is the belief that the species is all that matters when defining an individual. But this makes the basic logical error of confusing one of our properties, in this case being human, with who we are as such. For this reason, liberalism ironically functions as a continuation of Christianity's orientation towards a mystical otherworldliness, even while seeming to radicalize its orientation towards secular materialism and scientific naturalism. We know that liberalism is solely fixated on the ghost of mankind as such, because in this economic and political arrangement, any concrete individual who fails to conform to the abstract concept of man is quite literally made inhuman. Anyone who fails to be useful to the system will very soon find himself or herself thrown onto the human rubbish heap, whether that be prison, homelessness, etc. Stirner noted that the supreme irony inherent to such a system is that any real man who does not correspond to the abstract concept of man is treated as a ghost or an empty appearance devoid of essence, while the actual ghost of humanism or mankind or human nature is preserved in all of its illusory pseudo-being. But if I reveal the latter to be an illusion, I realize that I don't have to work to become man, because I already am my own species. For just that reason, there can be no universal laws or norms or models for me to have to conform to belatedly or from a second remove away. In fact, the liberal humanist call to model oneself after man is just a watered-down version of the age-old Christian mandate to model oneself after the perfect man of Jesus Christ, proof that man has become the new god in a supposedly secularist era can be seen in the way in which we define human rights in modernity. We feel that we can only deal with our fellow concrete humans in the liberal state if man is first posited as the abstract intermediator over our relations, for we require man to bestow upon us the kind of universal human rights which we then use to mediate our relations with others. Now, this is really just a continuation of the old pious Protestant act of thanking God for having had the grace to save those poor sinners who never could do enough good works to save themselves. In just the same way, the liberal humanist feels grateful to mankind for having granted everything to him through a godlike grace, through giving us human rights. Scherner dares to voice the blasphemous thought, though, what if my power is not graciously given to me by man? What if my power really is my own? Well, we actually do have a word for that kind of power. The word for it is property. Likewise, it is not only liberalism, but also communism, which are founded upon a fundamental misunderstanding of who we are. Communism is wrong precisely because it assumes that an equality of rights is not only possible, but is something that has always already been granted to us through nature itself, and that according to communists, it was only the artificial invention of private property at some unidentified moment in the prehistorical past, which introduced social inequality into an otherwise perfectly egalitarian world. This communist reference to absolutely equal rights, however, relies on a very subtle equivocation which few thinkers other than Stirner could have noticed. To say that I have the right to X really means that X lies within my power, but what that really means is that I have the right to do that which I only have the power to do, which means that I already had that power, not because it was given to me by man as an abstract human right, but because it already was really my own. Now that might sound like a mouthful the first time you hear it, but if you really think about it, communists make the basic error of thinking that everyone really can get equal enjoyment out of life in a consumeristic sense, simply through having all of our labor be equalized, without realizing that the enjoyment which is sought out can only be realized if one has the innate power to do so. 
But this innate power cannot be arbitrarily guaranteed or imposed upon us from some outside source like the state. To explain this, though, we have to revisit the age-old formula, spelling out how might and right are related. We usually think that might is determined by right, that is to say you can do X only because you were allowed to do X by some authority like the state which gave you the right to do so. But Stirner notes that it's really the other way around. We know this is the case because we say that someone was served right both when they tried to do something they couldn't do and failed, but also if they tried to do something which seemed impossible but succeeded. In both cases, whether doing X was right or not right was determined solely by whether that person might do it in the sense of having the power. Or to put it more briefly, one has the right to do something only because one really could do it. And that was only because he or she was the kind of person who had such a power. Such a right, therefore, cannot be arbitrarily dished out to everyone without exception by some institutionalized authority like the state. For the latter's authority is not quite as real as it appears to be, and certainly not real enough to overturn this basic law. Instead, prioritizing might over right, as Stirner does, allows one the kind of nuance which allows one to avoid any strict binary of absolute right or wrong, because such a shift in perspective will allow one to see that such designations as right and wrong can only be judged after the fact and not in accord with any rigid, universal, or pre-given laws. Positing universal laws of the state, which could supposedly predetermine one's behavior through a rigid binary of absolutely right and absolutely wrong acts, is therefore fundamentally incompatible with the kind of thing which we ourselves really are. Such supposed laws over our behavior aren't really universal, and for that reason they aren't really laws, because if you really think about it, if nobody bothered to believe in these ghosts through observing them through their behavior, they really wouldn't be able to control anything. The deeper problem with the will of the state and the will of the ego, though, is that the two are, by their very natures, antithetical to one another. Regardless of what the state says that it does, what the state really does is just monitor the will of the ego and keep it restrained. Under such conditions, the people themselves eventually become so over-socialized that they join in and actively police the rest of the social body by constantly looking out for egoists. And they do so through upholding the pseudo-ethical mandate that only those people who renounce their ego can be accepted as good citizens. All of our notions of crime, in fact, presuppose the existence of fixed ideals which, as we saw in the first lecture, are treated as sacred precisely because they contain an element of alienation. It was noted in the last lecture that the most impressive mathematical proofs are never treated as sacred because we understand transparently that these were worked out by our own minds. But pretty much any religious text which claims to have been authored through divine inspiration is given the title of sacred precisely because it contains an element of alienation. Our notions of crime in modernity are also founded on this notion of sacred laws which cannot be violated precisely because we feel alienated from them and are therefore founded on ghosts which only seem to exist as long as we project their existence. This can be found in the way that infidelity, for example, appears as a crime worthy of state punishment, but only on condition that another ghost is first posited as a real thing. That other ghost is, of course, marriage. But marriage really isn't a concrete thing that could exist without being believed in by our minds, for you might notice that marriage is defined very differently in different religions or cultures. Just consider the way that polygamy is illegal in some religions or nations, but is openly encouraged in others. The solution to social conflicts among different kinds of people is therefore not to posit a more general or more universal category, such as a universal religion that would subsume all particular religions into it by being universally compatible with all of them. Instead, the solution to social conflict, Stirner tells us, 
would be to have each one of us assert ourselves as something which is even more unique, which means less universal. This shift in perspective allows me to see that insofar as I have limits, these are not the pseudo-limits imposed by state law or any other ghost. My limits really are just deficiencies of my own power, and for that reason they are not absolutely fixed. For these limits can be overcome through increasing myself. Stirner goes on to clarify that his harsh criticisms of the social ideologies of his era must be understood in the etymological context that the German word Gesellschaft, or society, is derived from the mundane word for a hall, which really means that the only criteria for a society to be a society is that its members inhabit the same physical space. A real union among people, however, cannot be achieved quite as easily as just having them be collected into the same all-encompassing set. Such a society founded on the Hall model will always feel more like a prison, in which its members will always really feel inclined to be plotting their escape from it in one way or another. Stirner sounds a lot like Jacques Ellul when he notes that, in reality, the state will always do far more than simply collect its various members into the same physical space, for that act of collecting them is itself just a means to an end for the real goal of constructing an extended social machine that uses this collectivized labor to pump out a finished product which no one of these cogs can really recognize as their own work. The state, then, is an inherently technological system because it uses abstract human rights as a means to an end to transform its inmates into the most inhuman cogs in its service. We know that this is the case because of the way that a state punishes misfits is through inverting the formula of inclusion and utilization by damning them into nothingness, by giving them no place in the collectivity, and through giving them no work, and by extension, no way to consume its products. In this sense, Stirner cor correctly predicted the rise of a social credit score system in which people would be screened out beforehand for positions within society as workers and consumers through having their history of disobedience within childhood follow them into adulthood. However, even if one escapes that terrible fate through being successfully included in and utilized by the system, this will still be a lose-lose situation, for one will still find oneself in a form of technological slavery, which is arguably just as bad as Jacques Ellul noted in the technological society. The state's banishment of misfits into the status of nothingness misses the point, however, that I may indeed be nothing, but that is only because it is up to me to create myself from nothing. In contrast, the state is a nothing plain and simple, because the state is just one more ghost, which only seems to exist as long as people believe that it does. Similarly, Stirner implied that he found it useless to place any hope in a political party to save one from the tyranny of the state, because political parties are themselves just smaller states nested into the larger state. Nationalism makes this contradiction between self and state more explicit by turning me into the property of the nation, while asking me to somehow be proud of that fact rather than allow me to have pride in owning something which is really my own property. But we should clarify that by property, we do not mean this in the same sense that the legal system does, for what the state calls yours is something that I always want to make mine, and I only expect you to do the same for me. The communist critique of property, for all of its obsessiveness over the term, really doesn't have anything to say about that kind of property. For to understand what property really means, we have to revisit the idea introduced a little earlier that right is determined by might rather than the other way around. To use Stirner's own example, by the final years of the Roman Empire, even though the Romans had not legally agreed to hand over their empire to the Germanic invaders, they had still lost ownership over it, simply because they no longer had any power over it. The abstract right to take the empire away had not been formally granted to the Germanic invaders by any state, 
but that was the whole point. There was no need to do so because the innate power of the invaders had already been a transfer of ownership into a concrete reality with no need to be formally linguistified by any institution with a supposed authority. For this same reason, the state today cannot predetermine in advance whether I will be rich or poor, successful or a failure, or any other thing, because the state does not have the power to determine from a second remove away what my own innate power will be. For only the latter will really get determined what will be mine as my property. Stirner sounds a lot like Jordan Peterson in the 12 Rules for Life when he asks whether someone who has nothing might have that status precisely because that person is nothing, in the sense of having no power because of their own lack of seriousness in improving themselves. If such will inevitably be the case for a certain percentage of the population, the state really can't do anything to change that fact simply through artificially redistributing goods throughout the social body, for the latter action will never be quite as disinterested as the state claims it will be. Instead, that act will always be contingent upon first having one renounce the ego in favor of taking on some other role which is only approved by the state because it makes that person more useful to it through having them agree to be incorporated as a smaller part of that much vaster system. Under such conditions, even if I really earn my pay through producing works with tangible or concrete value, I cannot simply go to the client to directly negotiate a correct price, because all of that will be regulated by the state, which will demand that we first go through the legal courts or else be charged with the crime of doing business unlawfully. In that sense, the state is just a secularized continuation of the old Christian idea of the intercessor between man and God. The state is basically the Roman Catholic idea of Mary, the mother of God, in that it also negates any direct relation between egos by having a pseudo-divine intercession be required in order to have one's prayers be heard. It also bears mentioning that property is not just physical. My property also includes my thoughts. The state is arguably even more obsessed with controlling that sense of property. For you may have already noticed that the state allows no private thoughts unless they are redundant of its own thoughts in the sense that Ted Kaczynski would later call the system's neatest trick, in which the system openly encourages people to rebel against it, so long as they fight for those same technological upgrades which the system already needs, such as gender fluidity, the dissolution of national borders, or the loss of parents' rights to raise their own children as they see fit. In contrast, real freedom would mean getting to have private thoughts, through one's own innate power of thinking, precisely when those thoughts contradict what the state had predetermined that one should think. Only then would those thoughts really be my own property. Likewise, the mystery regarding what property I am entitled to can now easily be answered. It's just whatever property I empower myself to. Under those terms, the quote-unquote right amount of property for me cannot be determined in the abstract by any external institution such as the communist or liberal state, for that system will always allocate to me a share of the goods only through considering the needs of man in general rather than the needs of this ego. To give an equal amount of property to each individual also will not work in the real world, because that would presuppose that each one of us is just a smaller part of the same collectivized social system. But if each of us really is our own unique self, and is by definition no part of any other thing, one should not pay with money, which can be arbitrarily measured out to all in equal measure by some centralized authority like the state. Instead, one should pay incompetence, because the latter is unique to each. Doing so will establish a correct relation between property and empowerment, in that the former will follow directly from the latter, says Stirner. With this relation between property and empowerment established, 
we will also be able to understand that just as we now lament widespread poverty and blame the rich for it, without realizing that they already donate a lot of money and resources to alleviate the same poverty which they are accused of willfully creating, the idea of having the state step in to abolish poverty as a whole through taking property away from the rich misses the point that even the state itself is not powerful enough to guarantee equal, let alone identical, outcomes for all. To use Stirner's own example, nobody else could paint Raphael's paintings for him. It was up to Raphael alone to produce what was in accord with his own innate power, because both the paintings and the power to create those paintings were his own. Whatever I can be in the future, then I already, in a certain sense, am, in the sense that these can only follow from the power that I have as a unique ego. To use Stirner's own example to prove this, we know in a certain sense that a natural-born musician is going to excel, even if that person is only given one very poor quality instrument. But one person lacking that talent will fail, even if given all of the best equipment and training in the world. Artificially rigging the system to force someone to achieve what he or she is not capable of achieving will not ever actually work in the real world. It's because possibility and reality for Stirner are not separated. They always coincide with one another. Stirner sounds eerily similar to 21st century accelerationists when he argues that the kind of system which he seeks to accelerate the dissolution of is not just the modern systems of liberalism, socialism, or communism. It is instead the underlying feudalistic system which continues to survive to the present day, albeit in stealth form. Stirner warns that for all of its apparent obsoleteness, Feudalism never really disappeared. It is true that medieval feudalism died with the revolution, only to be resurrected in a new feudalism of man. This new feudalism of man, rather than, say, medieval church, is, however, every bit as tyrannical, because it posits mankind rather than, say, Christ as the ideal one has to live up to, but only because... That is an abstraction, which none of us really is, which inherently restricts our freedom to act in accord with our own power. To quote directly from the text, Stirner says, The whole condition of civilization is the feudal system, the property being man's or mankind's, not mine. A monstrous feudal state was founded, the individual robbed of everything, everything left to man. Because of the religious nature of feudalism, one might add, the individual had to appear as a quote-unquote sinner through and through. Interestingly, Stirner seems to argue that dissolving feudalism fully will not lead us beyond capitalism so much as it will take us to what today would be called anarcho-capitalism. This is because being freed from the arbitrary regulations of the state would be the real revolution against the system, in which case communism is no revolution at all, for it only makes the former even more powerful. Ironically, under the conditions of anarcho-capitalism, the egoist would be freed up to love his fellow humans more. And this would precisely be because he would no longer be artificially compelled to do that through any authority or moral code. The egoist, in fact, can only really love the other if this is not forced into existence by the coercion of a ghost-like religious morality or the socialist state. For real love comes to fruition only if it pleases the person to do so, and if it follows spontaneously from his nature and will. Likewise, whereas the state is defined by illusion and coercion, a real union among egos is possible because the latter would be the work produced by them from their own power by choice, in which case that union would also be among the things counted as their own. Now it bears mentioning that such a union would not have to be a union of equals, for we can never really be made equal except in thought. Only the idea, phantasm, or ghost of equality can make us seem to be equal. But that is the entire point, for a union of egos who are really their own would have to be something other than an artificial union upheld through an act of belief. So this will finish 
our discussion of this text, at least for the moment. I thank everybody who has um, listened and who has uh, contributed to the comments section, and I look forward to further discussions.